Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Many years ago, Carol and I took a vacation on the mainland, and while we were there, we were traveling of all places in a place called Chattanooga. Now, Chattanooga has a famous uh, Civil War battleground there on top of Lookout Mountain, and in Lookout Mountain are a bunch of sightseeing places, one being Ruby Falls. Now, Ruby Falls goes about a mile down and a mile in. I may be exaggerating only a little, but on vacation, I, I don't do this generally, but this time it was in the early 70s, and I decided to be real rebellious and I was growing a little bit of a beard, you know. And I was so proud of this stubble all over my face because nobody would see me. Professor at Florida Bible College, you know, I was being really relaxed. And I'm now a mile down, a half a mile in. You have to kind of do a tuck and duck thing as you're going by because the paths back in the 70s were so small in the Ruby Falls. Plenty dark in there. And Carol and I are holding hands as we're doing that. Just holding hands, relax. We're holding hands. And someone comes by as they were doing this, tuck it in and, and let the other group go by. And as they do, this person walks right in front of my face and says, oh, Dr. Pons, that's you. You're Dr. Pons, aren't you? And he's going with the rest of the group. And I'm thinking, dark, way down in Ruby Falls, someone sees me. Later on in the same trip, God was really speaking to me for sure. Now we're in the middle of the night. As you travel across country, I like to travel at night. A lot less traffic. It's cooler. I'm going. Don't worry. No ticket. I stop for gas. In a remote gas station, I can't even remember the state nor the city on the side of the road in the wee hours of the morning. And I'm putting gas in there. Someone pulls up behind me. And after a while, they say, you're Dr. Pons. Don't you teach at Florida Bible College? I said, yes, I, I do. W didn't you do camp way back in the early 60s? I said, yes, I did. I remember when you spoke at camp. I thought, I can't hide anywhere in this world. And the last illustration is that it's not just your face. Because we're on radio, <clears throat> I'm eating at a restaurant with Carol. And there's a couple behind me, and they get up, and I'm not paying much of attention. But as they walk by, he taps me on the shoulder, and he says, Aren't you Pastor Stan Pons from International? And I said, Yes, I am. And I said, Who are you? And he says, I never met you before, but I recognized your voice from radio, you know? <laughs> Now, why am I telling you that? You're laughing because of all the people that saw me. I'd like to tell you how many times I saw you at a traffic light picking your nose. No, I'm not. Relax. <laughs> relax. I haven't seen that. I hope, I hope you don't do that. But you have seen people who've done that. I'm sure you have. That being said, we can get away with a little bit of beard. We can get away with maybe pumping gas and someone says hi. But what will it do for our testimony when we think that we're away from other people, whether it's here on the island, which is a small island, or way on the mainland, and we think nobody will see us, and people do. Now, my message today is having integrity when people are watching you. Now, I'm going to talk about some practical things to do because people are watching you. But I want to make sure that you hear the core value of who I am as a person, as a preacher, and I want you to get is this. While it is important because people are watching you to live with integrity, Remember, if you just do it because people are watching you, then often what's going to happen is a lot of sin management, which means as long as people don't know you, as long as you don't care whether they see you, it's all right, then you're going to live the way you want. And that's not where the Lord wants us to be. He wants us to have integrity from the inside out, from the heart, when people are watching us and when they're not watching us. Now, let me take it up a notch. If you have that as your core value, I don't care if anybody sees me or not, I want to have integrity with you, Lord. Once you make that commitment, it makes then living a life of integrity in front of other people so much easier because you made the decision because God's watching everything we do. I remember many years ago I was teaching a junior high youth department and I gave them a verse in Hebrews that said this, that I'm quoting scripture, that everything is naked and open before the Lord with whom we have to give an account. I shouldn't have done that with junior high kids. I scared the mud out of them because they were afraid that God could see them in the shower. The real reason is God can see them in the shower because he can see their heart. And basically, it's not talking about nudity as much as it is everything about us is exposed. I remember when the whole concept of accountability was really uh, the new wave. It started at the early onset of Promise Keepers in the early 90s because they were talking about men being accountable with one another, getting into accountability groups. And they had accountability statements that were excellent. And I am not saying anything negative about that. 
But I do want you to know that, again, you can have all the accountability that you want in front of other people, but God's accountability means even when you don't give accountability to someone else, you will give an account of what we do in our thought, talk, and walk privately from our heart before the Lord. Well, in the passage today, we're going to talk about living our life in front of the eyes of, and in some versions it'll say, Gentiles. That's just a people group that's non-Jewish. So we talk about anybody who doesn't know Christ as Savior. While specifically it says Gentiles, it says it for a particular reason, because in this particular area, Peter was talking to those that were really impacted by a Gentile community because of the emperor Nero and all that was going on. So he's saying, watch out, the people you live with, which were mostly Gentiles, are watching you. And may I just say this, how many of you do not live next door to a Jewish person? Would you raise your hand? Put your hand up if you do how many of you don't know what the person is next door to you? <laughs> no, my, brother. All right. my point simply being this, people are watching what you're doing. So let's take us and look at this passage. I want you to look at verse 12. Open your Bibles. You can follow along in your message notes if you'd like, or up on the screen, or your Bible under the pew, or the one you brought. But I want you to look at 1 Peter 2.12. What a cool verse here it says. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers... They may see your good deeds and glorify God. Now that is an entire sermon all by itself because it says keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. That means you do it all the time, 24-7. Then it says so that when they speak against you, it doesn't say if they do, they will speak against you. I'm sure that no matter what you do, they will find something about you that they either don't like because you have a Christian worldview, they have a secular worldview, and they'll find something in your Christian worldview, thinking, belief system, that they just don't think is right. Primarily because... We have what we call definitive truths, and they want to have moral relativism. So even that in itself, they'll speak against you, let alone if you do do something against their value system. So they will speak against us. But go on, it says this, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. So while they're speaking against you, they are still witnessing some good deeds about you. If you have your pen, circle the word see there. That's a very interesting word in the Greek because that word see at that point basically means to intent purely at you, looking so carefully at you, observing you, every little part about you. In fact, today, the modern colloquial word would be when they put you and what you're doing under a microscope. You've ever heard that term before? You're kind of watched under a microscope or magnifying glass. That's what they're doing. What's interesting, not only does it say it in this passage, Jesus says it in the book of Matthew when he says this, let your light so shine that when people see you, they may glorify God. And the CU is the same C there while they're peering intently at you. Now let me really bring it home. In the same book of 1 Peter, we're in chapter 2, but chapter 3, it talks about unsaved husbands who really want nothing to do with God, Jesus, the Word, or your Christianity wives. Those same husbands are going to be watching you for your chaste and separated lifestyle and what you believe and what you do. It's the same word. It's the word that they are watching you. In fact, we can have two responses for that. Besides, I don't care. That's not a real response. One could be, if they watch me, I am going to live my life in such a way that I want them to watch me because they need to see, perhaps for the first time or a long time, the most authentic Christian they can ever see. So bring it on, buddy. Open your shades. Listen to what I'm saying to my wife in my house. Watch how I drive my car, how I conduct myself on the job, on the team, on the sports field. You look at me. You watch me any way you want because I'm now going to model before you godliness so you can really see what it is genuinely. Or the other response could be this. I want to just cocoon and get away from the world. I want to live in a monastery so I can live as the way I want and no one then will ever see me. The reality of it is we can't do the latter, but... We can choose to do the former. So it talks about people watching us. Well, now, if we stay in the same context of 1 Peter chapter 2, there are three mountain peak principles that they're going to be watching you in. So I'm glad there's only three, although I want you to know in Scripture there's a whole lot more. But for today, there's three. And I'm praying that we as a family would own these. I'm praying for me as perhaps a shepherd of you, a modeler, that I would model these. And so these are areas that people are going to be watching you in specifically to see if you're a genuine, true blue, slice your wrist, bleed Christian or not. Well, let's look at them, if you will. Here's number one. Here's the first area, and that would be to keep away from temptation. I need to realize that I should live with integrity because people are watching me. 
And so I need to stay away from temptation. Look at verse 11. It says, Beloved, that tells me right away it's talking to Christians. So those of you that are in the faith right now, whether you're part of the church or not, it's really speaking to you. Those of you that are kind of on the outside, I want you to know that that's not a bad word. We want you to be part of the brotherhood, the sisterhood here of the saints. But look what it says here to those that know Christ as Savior. He doesn't tell the unsaved people to do this, the non-Christian, the people outside the faith, but he does tell us. He says, I urge you, take your pen and underline the word urge. It's not a suggestion, it is an urging. It's like telling your kids, I urge you to do your homework. I urge you to turn that paper in. It's going to come back and bite you if you don't. I urge you as sojourners exiles. That would be like those that are traveling through. Those are the people that aren't here all the time. They're kind of like aliens. They're just here for a little visit. They're a little bit more than a tourist, but at the same time, they really don't own the earth. Then it says to abstain from the passions of the flesh. You might circle the word abstain there. That really means avoid, stay away, steer clear of, stop from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Here's a question for you. If you're saying to yourself, you know, I I think I do that pretty well. I I, I do abstain. I do avoid temptation. Uh, How about the temptation maybe to be like the world too much. Now, I know this is going to sound, I don't want it to be legalistic, but I also want to kind of give you us a wake-up call. Have you ever been in a movie theater when something happened on the screen that you just knew was smack against your Christian values? Did you get up and walk out? Was there a time that you're watching something on television and you just know that it wasn't right? And you said, you know what? I don't care if it's a long plot line and many weeks I've invested into this show, it's over. I know I have and probably should do it more. And probably if we can really get humble and I mean really humble, I mean really, really humble, probably think that most every television show there is out there might come to that point in our life. Will we do that? Will we put a lock on our refrigerator if we have a problem with what we eat? I'm not here about weight and all that jazz. I am here about healthy bodies because this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do we do that? Wherever you might be, when you are sensing that this is a secular worldview and it's now tickling you, causing you to kind of want to smell it and taste it a little bit, for you maybe to kind of say, you know, I I need to keep away from that. I need to avoid that. Here's a question. Why should we do it? Well, we could spend all day going over all the answers to glorify God, blah, blah, blah. But in the passage, it's this. Because we're only here a short time. And only for a short time we want to do what we can. Now, let me speak to those of you that are ever were tourists. Whether you're a tourist out there and you're here today, or you're listening on the radio, you're on, in, on island for just a little bit, the rest of us, don't be so smug. We've been tourists because we go to another place. All right? But when we do, most times tourists, and I've been on, you know, we go on vacation, we go out, is we go to this place and we try to suck from this place every bit we can. We want to go to all the best tourist places, all the attractions, all the restaurants. We want to hike the highest trails. We want to swim the deepest oceans. We want to do everything we can because we only have a short period of time. How many of you, I know I'm exaggerating, but pretty much that's about how your vacation is. Would you raise your hand? Good. How many of you come back from your vacation so you can rest up (laughs) from your vacation? You know what I'm talking about. I said that to say this. That is not the mental attitude that we have as a Christian. I know I'm going to heaven. That's going to be glory up there. But right now I'm going to suck from my world right here. Everything I can. No, I don't want to do that. I'm only here a short time. I want to come to give rather than to get back. I do not want to be influenced by the secular worldview in any way possible. If anything, I want to show the secular worldview the superiority of Jesus Christ and to love them where they are, to wrap my arms around them, to let them know that there's a better life now Not a life without problems, but a life with a problem solver. And an eternal life later on. So why I do it is I'm only here a short time. I want to do it. You know, yesterday we had a bunch of guys that were painting. They were blowing stuff off the roof. They were cleaning all. And I come through the sanctuary here. And I counted no less than six centipedes all through here. Do you know what a centipede is? Have anybody ever been bitten by a centipede? Okay. I went... And when I went, I went to go get something to get up the centipedes because you'd be sitting here. When I came back, there were no centipedes. So they're probably in the chair somewhere right where you are. Now, I'm joking, so just relax. That's all a big ha-ha. But here's what I'm saying. If you knew there was a centipede there to bite you, wouldn't you move away? I love to watch some of you, especially the kids, when there's a bee nearby. The kids are going nuts. They're climbing the walls. Get that bee away from me. You ladies, how many of you love to play with a spider? You know, you go, I'm not just saying ladies. I know some guys that have a problem with a spider. 
How many of you like to swim with the sharks? We don't like, we, you know, the things that are going to affect us, that'll hurt us or harm us, we want to step away from, don't we? And so maybe there's a time in our life that we have to come to a point of some level of maturity to say, that could come back and bite us. And I need to step away from it. Then I need to keep away from it. So we need to be careful. Look over here what Peter writes in verse 16. He says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Now, I like that. I am free. I'm often asked, well, pastor, if you trust Jesus Christ as your salvation, could you lose your salvation if you do not live properly before God? In other words, if you don't live that separated life, could you lose your salvation? I'm going to tell you that uh, as bad as that is, you will not lose your salvation. But you could lose your integrity. And if you do live in sin, starting with your thought, it'll move into your talk out of the buns of the heart, mouth speaks. It'll be a part of your life. And when that begins to happen, you not only lose your integrity, you lose your reputation. You lose your testimony. And for some, they probably don't care because they... I give up. I don't care how I live. I hope you should start caring. But here's something else. The greatest thing I think you lose is your influence that you can have in someone else's life. Now that's all apart from what you've lost with the Lord. Not your salvation, but the intimacy that you want to have and He so much wants you to have with Him because He loves you. So we live this life avoiding temptation because we're here a short time. Because if we don't, it will bite us. We'll also not lose our salvation because we're saved by His grace and kept by His grace. But we certainly can lose our influence and I pray that we don't. How many of you realize not only are our Christian families and neighbors watching us, have you come to the point in your understanding that the media desperately seems to be on a vendetta against Christianity? In anything that even names the name of Christianity in any way looks like it might be Christian, especially if it is not filled with integrity, they certainly want to put that out in front of people and really amplify that thing. Do they not? We're experiencing that right now on the island. There's a man, young man, but an adult, randomly shoots and kills a mother of 10 children and shoots four other people. Now, you've been following that. What's so tragic is that somehow the media has to pull in the fact that he's a pastor's kid. Now, if someone else shot someone, they don't say, oh, that's a welder's kid. Or that's an accountant's kid. Or that's a bus driver's kid. But if it's a pastor, if it's a Christian leader, and if they're known for Christian visibility in some way, they have to make that an issue. I don't want them to make that an issue about me. And so we have to watch our integrity. I've learned this over the years. It's a hard lesson, but it's a reality lesson. It goes like this. I cannot control the lies that people will tell about me or about Carol. They cannot, I cannot control the lies or the spins they might say about who I am as a person, how I conduct myself. But I can tell you this. I can control the truth about me that I can at least project. You hear what I'm saying? I cannot control others, but I can control me. And I hope that each one of us would say, you're right, I can control me, and I don't want this plane to go down as I'm the pilot of my life. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, Lord, help me. I want you now to fill me with your spirit, and I want to have your integrity from the inside out. And so when temptations come, I want the spirit of God to prick my heart so that I can step away from that. And I hope you can come to this level. That if we're so weak and at that moment in our walk with God that the Spirit is speaking to us but we are unable to hear it or unwilling to hear it, that there will be another Spirit-controlled, influenced brother, sister, or mate that will come to us and be the voice of spiritual reason. And when they do, don't see them as an enemy. See them as someone who wants you to be the greatest influencer for Jesus Christ. So let's go to number two. People are watching, so live with integrity by keeping away from temptation. But more than that, 
we also have to yield to authority. There's three of these. And here's the second one, yielding to authority. This is a little bit longer portion of Scripture that talks about this, but it is very rich. And I wish I had more time to develop it, but there's enough in here for us to take home a great understanding of it. It talks about yielding to, uh, to authority here. Let me read it to you in verses 13, 14, 17, and 18. I know it's a little bit longer passage, but follow along as I read it. It says, be subject. I don't like that word as much. Maybe the word submissive. Be submissive for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil as well as to praise those who do good. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor, and now you servants, you be submissive to your masters with all respect, but not only to the good guys who are gentle, but also to those who might be unjust. I began to make a list in my notes about who would be those that are in authority over the majority of us people. I don't think this is a list that's very difficult. I think you could make it yourself. But generally speaking, it would be, first of all, the Constitution of the United States that has been set forth before us in all the rights that we have that is protected and hopefully properly interpreted by the Supreme Court. So we have all of those laws that are given to us that govern us. Then we have the people, we'll call them politicians or government, that's in place to either understand, interpret those, and then to use them to protect us as well as to punish the guilty. And so again, that would be our authority in our life, and I'm to submit to that every ordinance. And in that, I'm given the freedom to write letters, to vote, to make my voice heard properly. And then I can move into the place where I work. All of you, in a sense, are my boss. And so many of you are so good. It's the two of you. No, I'm joking. But the point still being, I serve you. You are my boss. I am accountable to my team. They're accountable to me. I'm accountable to the deacons. They're accountable to us. But together we work in submission to each other. I'm accountable if I had a second or job to those that have hired me. I'm accountable to those who might be my coaches if I'm in sports or those leaders if I'm in music, or those teachers if I'm in school, or those military personnel who might be over me. And if I'm married, I'd be the head of household in my home. So again, we have these that are over us. And God says in the King James Version, which I especially like, He refers to them as being even ministers, servants to us. And so they serve God by serving us, providing us with protection and also punishment of the evildoers. So I need to yield to those that have the rule over me. And I guess my question to you is, are you having a hard time doing that? Sometimes it's easy to do it to those that are really kind and good to us, but it sure makes it difficult. Personally, this is Stan speaking. I'm not representing the church now, but personally, I'm having a very difficult time with our present group of people that are in office in Washington. I have a hard time what I see happening. But I am very thankful that God is on the throne above all of them. And I'm very thankful that I have a mechanism in our country that I can write letters, vote people in or out. But I'm still having a difficult time with all of that. And you don't have to say amen. Everybody has their own personal issue with that. But I look at the word yield. Now the word yield does not necessarily mean I need to be a doorman, but it does mean that I have to yield. I know the results in my own personal life of someone not yielding to me when they needed to. Some of you know this story, but... I tell the same story, but there's different applications. So listen to this one application. I was 16 years of age. I, 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 I saved as much as I could, and the first big boy toy I bought was my own surfboard. And it was a longboard. But, I mean, I ate, slept, and drank surfboards. I looked at them all. There's not very many surfboard shacks where I lived because it was back in the 60s. And I finally, my, I saved everything that I could. I sacrificed, and I bought my first surfboard. I then went to the beach surfing with it about two or three months later. And I remember I was up on a wave, and those of you that surf, we have some that are in here. When you're up on a wave, and the wave is a wave that's generally going in, the, in, the, in a direction, some of them are just windblown chop, but if it's going in a direction, there is a right-of-way and a non-right-of-way. And I'm not talking about who has ownership, an island guy or a howley. I'm talking about the on the wave, what's the safest and non-safest place. So when the wave is peeling, let's say it's going left, and you're hanging a left on this thing, if you're closest to it and the wave is going this way... The right thing to do, anybody who would take off on your same wave, and some of them do, you've seen the surf movies, etc. When you're watching that happen, generally if this wave is caving in and this guy's having a problem, the other people on the outside of that wave need to what we call kick out, okay, or kick back. But for whatever reason, I had 
a new surfer guy, all right, a Grimmy. He's on this side and he's enjoying his wave and so he thinks he wants to just shred over to my side of the wave so he kicks over here and this wave's coming down and I don't have any room to go with him without hitting him. This wave's going to just nail me over here so I'm yelling, kick out, kick out, and he wouldn't. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.